Our next conversation is going to focus in on a subject that's already come up a number of times, which is the environmental context. Um, and you can go ahead and, and, and come up to the stage. Uh, in fact, the uh, World Wa Wildlife Fund's uh, example has all already been mentioned uh, specifically a couple of times, and now we get to hear from WWF uh, in particular. But first, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the next conversation, Suzanne Goldenberg, who is the U.S. environmental correspondent for The Guardian newspaper. She's also the author of Madame President about Hillary Cl Clinton's historic run for the White House in 2008. Suzanne has spent many years covering the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Chechnya, and has uh, been an intrepid foreign correspondent elsewhere. Uh, so one of the things that I, I, I like about this uh, pairing her up to have this conversation is that her journalistic trajectory covers some of what we're talking about here, which is uh, coming home, uh, the technologies have come home, and now we're looking at the uh, application and the leveraging of this technology in the environmental context in this conversation that's entitled Nature's New Watchdogs. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, as, as you might have gathered today, uh, the conversation that we're going to have uh, now with um, Carter Roberts and, and Robbie Hood is going to be focusing much more on the upside of drones than you will have heard about previously. And, specifically how these new technologies can be used uh, to protect wildlife and uh, to sort of prevent death, if, uh, you know, both of wildlife and of humans. Um, Robbie Hood is the director of uh, unmanned aircraft systems at, at NOAA, and she's overseeing this sort of uh, coming introduction of, of drones in, in forecasting and their use at uh, various levels to tell us more about uh, hurricanes and other dangerous storm systems that are coming our way, and also uh, to talk a little bit about how this technology can be used uh, for people who are at sea to, in, in instances of, of shipping. And uh, Carter Roberts is the president and chief executive officer of the World Wildlife Fund, and I think he's going to be able to tell us in great detail about how this technology is, has been used or is already beginning to be used on the ground in places like Nepal uh, to, to combat poaching, um, which is a war that uh, so far the conservationist groups seem to be on, on the losing side of, and hopefully this new technology uh, can, can reverse that or even the odds somewhat. But I'm going to ask Robbie if you can sort of start off and talking about how this technology is going to be deployed hopefully and how important it, you think it might be particularly in an era when we've seen budget cuts at NOAA when it comes to forecasting. Right. Thank, thank you very much. Um, at NOAA, which stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, collecting data is what we do. The National Weather Service is part of NOAA, the National Ocean Service is part of NOAA. And being able to understand what's happening in all parts of the, the planet is really important, and so observations are really important. We've got satellites and ocean buoys and rain gauges and radars and, you know, just about anything that, that you can think about. And so we're looking at UAS technologies as a way to, as a, just another observing system to come into the bigger observing systems that we're already using. And so we're looking at very, very small hand-launched um, short endurance ones all the way up to Global Hawk as part of a partnership with NASA and being looking at those long range and long endurance capabilities. One of the things that we've been emphasizing is trying to look at technologies that are already being, that are already very well fleshed out, like the ones that are being used by the military overseas, and how can we take those technologies and rapidly deploy them for scientific purposes. And I would say one of our biggest hurdles right now, we've heard of a lot of, uh, a lot of different things talking about the FAA and privacy issues, but for a scientific agency, our biggest hurdle is the cost. Uh, UASs can be everything, every observing system is relative. A Global Hawk is a very expensive aircraft, but it's cheaper than a satellite. And there are times when it could be very, very useful in helping us to get detailed information in far reaches of the, uh, over the ocean that we can't quite get to with other kinds of assets. Um, also, the little, the little ones, the hand launchable ones or, or things that we can launch from a ship, being able to 
work with those using science dollars, science research dollars. Um, that's what we're hoping is, is, is going to be one of the new, uh, new um, frontiers that we'll be able to tackle is, is to get the cost down so that many, many more um, applications can be used by a wider variety of people. And, and Carter, uh, we've heard that the World Wildlife Fund is really going forward with this technology in, in Nepal and, and in Africa, I, I believe. And what, what do you think it brings to the table from what you saw on your recent trip? Well, for the record, we were not the group that um, was putting up UAVs over uh, dove hunts in the southeastern United <laughs> States. Just to be clear. Um, and, um, but um, it's interesting, just this morning I was getting um, a whole series of emails from the Central African Republic where uh, rebel groups have overrun an area that's one of the most legendary areas for uh, elephants. And uh, we fear that there could be a, a massive slaughter that's occurring, but we don't know what's happening on the ground. This is one of the most remote places on Earth. And so in our work, we're, um, we're desperate for more information in the wildlife trade issue. It's really exploded over the past four years. Um, it's become a huge international issue in places like South Africa, where for years about 20 rhinos were taken uh, due to poachers. Over the past three years, it's jumped to 150 a year, 350 a year. Last year, it was 650. And this year, it looks like it's going to peak over 800. And it's become a, um, a huge crisis. And, um, and the bad guys are extremely sophisticated. They have night vision goggles, they've got helicopters, they have all kinds of funding and resources, and we need to up our game to, to, to combat what they're doing. And so we're trying to do that in places like Nepal, and Namibia, and Mozambique, and elsewhere. And, and Nepal, I mean, you were using them, from what I understand, you can use them to, to track gangs of poachers as they, what happens if they move across borders? What sort of complications do you get into there? Yeah, well, Nepal's a really interesting case because in Nepal, um, I want to do a before and after in Nepal. Two years ago, I went to Nepal to collar a tiger and drive him across the country and re-release him into the wild. And we put a $10,000 satellite collar on this tiger and uh, released him into the wild and then watched the tiger move, establish his territory, maybe even mate, and then we watched the collar stop moving. And that's the point where we went out into the field, found the collar, and there was no tiger. The collar was there, and at this point, the tiger is probably in a bottle of wine uh, being uh, used in China at some celebratory feast. And that's not the way it should work. And I was just there two weeks ago, where we were collaring a one-horned rhino. And I was with uh, the head of the military. I was with the chief warden. I was with the scientist there. We were putting yet another $10,000 satellite collar on this rhino. And, um, but we know that there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way, uh, not just to chronicle the demise of nature or the loss of these animals. There's got to be a way to have real-time data on the animals, real-time data on the poachers, and then a software system that enable us to mobilize uh, people to get to the right place at the right time. And so we now, we just received a grant from Google uh, as part of their Global Impact Awards that enables us to begin to test new technologies in practical, uh, scalable ways. And so, for instance, in Nepal and in Namibia right now, we're looking at um, using cell phone technologies to track animals so that you've got a chip um, in a, uh, with a rhino that can send text messages that instead of being collected by satellites can be collected by drones that pass overhead. You, we can begin to use drones. As, what, what are the costs of these technologies and oh, how do they help oh, that, sort of that equalize the field with, with the poachers? If you use uh, cell technologies and text messaging, it's a fraction of what a satellite collar would be. And then you can also begin to use drones to track uh, poachers using thermal in imaging at night because they're not active during the day, they're active at night. And uh, these are really remote places. Um, but the real gain for us is the software system that enables us to take data from animals, uh, data from tracking poachers, get that information uh, to rangers on the ground real time so that they can inter intercept the poachers before it's too late.
that, that's the real game. And, and ultimately, not just track the poachers, but track them back to the traders, because the real game in these big criminal syndicates is getting to the traders. That's the way we're going to interrupt uh, this crisis. By tracking them to the, their selling point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and sort of switching back and forth. But Bobby, I mean, when you're talking about the global hawks, which are the big systems, what, you know, we have seen, you know, the sort of kind of forecasting explode over the last decade, getting much more accurate information about impending hurricanes and dangerous weather systems that we're going to see more of and with more intensity because of climate change. So what does global hawk actually bring into the picture and how can that, uh, save lives, save businesses? Yeah, it's a, a one way to think of it is a force multiplier for, every is a force multiplier for science. Every way we hook in different kinds of observing system, everything should be working together. And what we're always looking at is what's the best resolution that will give us the information. Satellites are extremely good and satellites have improved our weather forecasting, especially in hurricane the hurricane forecasting fields, but satellites, some satellites only pass over a storm once a day, twice a day, and it takes a nice big snapshot. Sometimes you need to get in closer. We, uh, NOAA is very famous for its Hurricane Hunter aircraft that it flies through, through storms, but what a Global Hawk would be able to provide is a system that can go out and stay with the storm much, much longer. It's got a longer range, it can fly for 24 hours, so now we're able to fly over a weather system and actually stay with it. A satellite will pass over once or twice, or you may have a, a geostationary satellite that's going to take continuous pictures, but still, you will be able to get a closer look at a storm for a longer period of time, and that it fills that niche that we can't quite satisfy right now. And in terms of privacy concerns, what sort of levels are we talking about? Well, actually, privacy concerns, I mean, we're, we intend to abide by whatever the rules and regulations are defined by, uh, by our government system. But right now, we, it's like someone said earlier, we don't use any sensor that we're using now is something that we've already developed for a manned aircraft. So we are only going to use uh, UASs for scientific purposes. So we don't we don't collect privacy data now with our manned aircraft, then we won't collect privacy data with the unmanned aircraft. It's all about the science data. Okay. And for, I mean, pres presumably it's not the privacy issues that come into play so much as the sort of law enforcement issues that would come into play when you're with a mm -hmm. wi wildlife trade. Yeah, you, you know, know the, uh, the big ones. The, the places we're talking about in the world are extremely remote. Uh, they, uh, they're generally uh, unpopulated. Uh, they, um, you know, the place where I was in Nepal has the world's tallest grasses. It's, uh, it's almost impenetrable. The, typically, the only way you can move through that area is on the back of an elephant. Uh, and, um, and so the privacy issues aren't that great because um, nobody's supposed to be there. Uh, and uh, and what, we're, uh, what we're tracking is uh, people who are entering the park typically at night. Uh, and so, um, uh, so what we're really looking for is the movement of poachers in really remote places, uh, in places where nobody's supposed to be there. And so uh, the privacy issues are almost but um, irrelevant. What kind of concerns though, do governments, such as the governments of India and the governments of Nepal, raise about the, the use of these technologies and issues of foreign control? Well, that, that's um, you know, our work, whether it's Namibia or South Africa or Nepal, starts and ends with governments, because governments at the end of the day need to enforce the laws that are on their books. They're the ones who need to um, catch the poachers. And so we've learned a lot about engaging with governments around um, uh, their air, um, air restrictions, um, radio frequency restrictions, um, uh, security issues on the ground. And then, of course, a lot of the places we're talking about are on, in border areas. And so when I was in Nepal recently, we were also releasing gharials into the river. And the gharial is this um, incredible um, uh, uh, alligator, relative of the alligator, with a very long, narrow snout, extremely rare, almost endangered. And we were releasing these gharials into the river. And the Nepal government had collared the gharials uh, with satellite collars to track them. And as they move, the river we were on flows into India. And a few years ago, one of these gharials floated into India. Uh, someone noticed the collar, noticed a radio antenna, and 
the whole uh, area lit up with accusations in Nepal's spine on India using a uh, agario, which um, uh, is a little improbable, but, um, but nevertheless, in every single region that we work, we start with that government. It ends up being a government initiative. And, um, and as we're piloting, kind of what's the sweet spot in this technology uh, in terms of practicality, cost, replicability, we're also piloting how best to work with governments to address the issues you've raised. I wanted to ask you, obviously, about international collaboration and, and the potential right. friction that yeah, you've well, seen. One of the things, um, when we do scientific experiments, we always have to get permission of the country that we're going to, even with manned aircraft now. So that part won't be any different. Um, one of the exciting things that I think is um, really interesting about UAS is, is that UASs are already designed. When, you know, they're generally designed to bring data back in real time. And I have, in my early part of career, I worked for NASA and I, was, I participated in some hurricane uh, research experiments where we flew aircraft through the top of, of uh, hurricanes. And there, when you're on the aircraft, you've got 40 scientists that you're talking to on headsets. And it's, it is an exciting experience. But once I started working with UASs, and we've done an experiment with NASA that, that looks at hurricanes, being able to sit in, a, in, a, in front of a computer monitor and have all that data come through to you and being able to chat with your local scientists across the country, it really brings the science experience to a bigger audience. And I think it's going to bring science data and science discovery to even greater populations across the world and to younger students. So to be able to put a camera on a UAS and watch it fly through a hurricane is going to be the same thing I've seen in my career, but to be able to provide that to you know, other students and other citizens of the world, I think it's going to be very exciting. So there is a flip side to the privacy part, is that we are actually making data more readily accessible to others. And in terms of international cooperation or collaboration on, on some of these developments, is there something you can tell us about? We, uh, at NOAA, we've been um, working with international groups. Basically, there a lot of the government agencies are working together to work with the FAA to get access to national airspace. There are similar organizations in the international community for civilian uh, air control. And it really just depends on the country. Many countries right now are very open-minded about bringing uh, UAS activities, especially for scientific research. Uh, another area that's that's got a lot of international connection behind it is being uh, being is doing new studies in the Arctic. So m nine countries circle the Arctic, and all those countries have interest in what's happening up there with climate change and sea ice change, and, and new, as new shipping routes open up or if there's oil spills. And so there's already discussions at the international level about how could you share. Uh, assets, whether you share the assets themselves or you share the data uh, through, you know, through doing uh, more experiments. So there's a lot of discussion that needs to happen with this, the, the aviation authority side of countries, but at the scientific level, I would say the scientists to scientists in other countries were all pretty excited about working with this technology. And do you encounter that level of enthusiasm as well as you go into Asia and Africa? You're smiling a little ruefully. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's really, um, you know, uh, some of the greatest parts in the world are in border areas because it's the way governments resolve boundary disputes. It's interesting. Um, and um, in the wildlife trade that I was talking about is inherently a global issue. It is, it's a, um, the, these criminal syndicates that, that move across borders quite seamlessly and um, in the trade, um, you, we may have a problem in Africa, but it's being driven by demand in places like Vietnam and China and Thailand. And so we have begun to work with um, governments. Um, we we, uh, we co-host kind of a, what is the wildlife trade equivalent of Interpol called Traffic. Uh, Crawford Allen, who's in the audience, runs that program for us. Um, but um, this has become a huge international crisis, and Secretary Clinton, before she left, called for a major intelligence review to work with other countries on sharing intelligence about this so that we can kind of unlock the mysteries of these very shadowy networks that operate across borders and, um, and often use the proceeds from selling animal parts to buy guns and, um, and other materials. So, um, this has become a, a high profile for, um, for the State Department, and we're seeing much more collaboration across countries. But we have a lot of work to do, as you say. Um, we're not winning this battle yet. 
Have you, we had an indication yet from John Kerry how he sees this in terms of uh, on his list of priorities at the State Department? You, you know, it's interesting. When he, uh, Senator Kerry, uh, hosted one of the biggest briefings on the wildlife trade right before he left, and um, it focused mostly on the slaughter of elephants in Africa. And so I know that he, he regards this as a major issue to address. Uh, we look forward to working with him on this. Uh, he's been one of the stalwarts on both on climate change and also on the wildlife trade issue. And uh, Robbie, I wanted to get back to that issue of the Arctic Council. What, what kind of information do uh, these Arctic nations want to get out of the Arctic? Because that's this area that's really in play right, now right. with climate change. It's basically, it's basically joint understanding of what's happening in the Arctic. But, in, but each country has its own, you know, so with some countries like Canada, it's, you know, it's the economic zones and, and protection of their country. Um, mi mi most of them are all concerned about what would happen if oil, you know, with more, more oil drilling and if there is an oil spill, how would you even tackle that problem? Because it's going to be so much more complicated because of the, the harsh climate there. Um, also, as new shipping routes, you know, as the ice diminishes, there's going to be opening up more opportunities for sh for other ships to pass through there. Well, if if we can't if we can't um, predict the weather well enough, ships could actually get stranded if things freeze up very suddenly. So there's a lot of safety issues as well. But I would say, in general, most all of the countries are really interested in actually what's happening and then what 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 the changes in the Arctic are going to bring to their country in the long run. What would have happened three years ago had NOAA had this technology during the BP spill? What would we have known? What was, would it have been possible to know about the size of the spill, the flow rate, anything using this technology? Right. Would it have added to Well, the, the BP spill was a little bit different because it happened in the Gulf and there were so many assets coming out there. There were a lot of manned aircraft too. Um, but yeah, we're doing experiments within our agency where we're actually looking at putting different kinds of sensors on, on uh, UASs so that we can fly out and get to regions that are, are, are harder to get to. Um, one thing, especially um, some of our colleagues up in Alaska, they have oil spills all the time in Alaska because there's so much oil business up there. And so we'd like to get to the point where that we would have assets that are easy to use. So some of our smaller ones that are hand launchable, they're container size, it would be nice to have those at at NOAA station, you know, NOAA weather stations or on NOAA ships so that if something happens like a, a say a, a, a derelict fishing net or some kind of marine debris is rolling in the ocean, you can find it easier by, you know, using this, this asset that you've got, already got on the ship and you can fly it out over this thing and, and take a look at it. Same thing with oil spills. We could do better at, you know, being able to look at the size and actually detect, you know, exactly the, the, the extent of it as far as latitude and longitude as well. What do you estimate the cost of one of those handheld systems uh, we, to be? We're right now, and this is not a, a particular plug because at, at, at NOAA we're looking at all different kinds of systems, but we are making some investments in Puma systems which are uh, hand launchable, but we really like those because they land in the water and a lot of the observations that we collect at NOAA are, are ocean based. So those kinds of systems normally run, you know, 300 to 400 to 500,000 uh, in that that range, but that's three aircraft in a ground control station. Another obviously very remote area that comes to mind where we would like to know more is this Pacific garbage patch. I mean, is there a way that drones could be used as eyes in the sky well, in actually, that area and in actually, what way? Yeah, my program actually has a, a small project that we're funding that's, that's actually looking at that as, you know, uh, and it's, it's, it's a marine debris and part of it is, it the motivation for it was the the debris that's coming in from the tsunamis and how that's affecting the Alaska coastline in Hawaii. But also it's just being able to find these things. One of the hardest things is, uh, especially with things like derelict fishing gear or fishing nets and, and other things that are lost to sea, it tumbles through the ocean and it, collect, it just gets bigger and bigger with time. And it's really hard to find them. So what we're trying to look at is a multi-tiered approach where maybe you look at, uh, maybe you can look at chlorophyll streams with satellites and that, and, and it, they, they're finding that some of the debris tends to go with those str the same streams that have the chlorophyll. And then you could maybe take a ship out there and fly something from the ship to make it easier. So we're always trying to look at how we can connect those observing systems to make them the most efficient that they can be. 
And, and Carter, is there, uh, we've, we've talked to this point about the sort of war on poaching, the efforts to stop yeah. this. Well, <laughs> there's still these endangered wildlife left. In what, if we're, what other um, uses can be made of this technology in terms of just establishing a baseline on populations? Is it, a, is it advantageous to use there? Is that an application you see going forward? Uh, yeah, very much so. I, you know, there's a whole litany of, um, of uh, animals that we that live in these remote places that we uh, we and others are using this technology to track their populations, whether it's walruses in the Arctic or orangs in Malaysia or elephants in uh, Indonesia. Um, just yesterday there was a, a piece um, about sandhill cranes in the United States. Um, that's all super important. the The other thing that's important for us is also tracking human uses in these areas. So no matter which place we're talking about. One of the greatest uh, uh, ways in which habitat is being destroyed is by conversion to agriculture. And, um, and a lot of the biggest companies on earth and also um, governments want to eliminate illegal products from their supply chains because those are the ones that typically have the greatest impact. So not just tracking the animals but also tracking um, the productive uses of land, uh, tr tracking uh, deforestation by companies, often illegal in some of these areas, tracking uh, fishing um, in parts of the ocean that are far, far away, and being able to relay that information back to be part of a database so that companies can make decisions on purchasing based on what's legal, what's not, and then also be able to have data, data to go after some of the bigger companies that are breaking their commitments. So that whole array of um, monitoring animals, also monitoring land use is enormously important. And I think um, the LIDAR example that was shown earlier has been um, you know, being able to track forests, track their size, track their carbon content, track what's happening to them, and track who is doing, uh, making those changes on the land is going to be an enormous part of our future work. Mm -hmm. To what, I mean, both uh, NOAA and, and WWF have talked about deploying these technologies in the near future, I think before 2015. But if you were to take us out to the end of the decade, where, you know, and given that the money is finite, where, sort of name three areas do, where you think, uh, both in sort of project area and geography, where you think we can expect to see these technologies deployed on a more routine basis? Yeah. Um. Yeah, resources are finite. If anyone in the room wants to make a contribution to WWF <laughs> in this work, we'd <laughs> welcome that. Uh, but uh, the, uh, okay, I'll, I'll um, one example would be, um, would be Africa, would be in the Congo, where you have these deep, um, intact forests. Um, the, the rule of law is variable, where we don't really know, we can judge from the, from satellites kind of, um, land cover, but that's a very different thing than being able to track the movements of either animals or poachers or, um, or timber companies on the ground. So I would predict that there would be a regular systematic use of uh, UAVs in that area to, um, to develop information, bring it back real time to rangers on the ground, to law enforcement officials on the ground, and to us to be able to monitor the changes in that region and respond real time. And do you think that's something that's going to be in the budgets of these governments, or it's going to have to be something that, uh, that will be done by international conservation groups? Uh, you know, long term, it's going to have to be in the budgets of these governments. You know, our role is more to assist governments than to do their job for them. You know, at the end of the day, uh, when it comes to apprehending um, uh, militias on the ground, we can't do that. You know, we can't raise a, a submachine gun and, and, can't, and, and take people down in the forest. We, we can't do that. That's the role of governments. Uh, but we can assist governments with, with technology, with training, with understanding how to uh, develop better monitoring protocols. Another example would be, um, I would say, in the South Pacific, where some of the richest fisheries on Earth, some of the most important coral reefs on Earth, there's a lot of illegal fishing that is being undertaken. We're now working with some of the biggest companies on Earth, Bumblebee Tuna, um, Starkist, and others who have said, we are not going to buy any more product that comes from illegal fisheries. And every boat's going to have a barcode, every fish is going to have a barcode, and, um, and I predict that we'll see more and more use of technology to track fishing practices in those regions and have that play a role in the economy. 
of things like tuna and, and some of the biggest fisheries on Earth. And a third one, I would say, uh, would probably be in the Arctic. You know, the Arctic, yeah, it's amazing how much the, um, of the Arctic belongs to the United States, but most U.S. citizens um, aren't really aware of what's happening up there. And it's one of the last pristine places on Earth. Uh, it's changing in front of our eyes. It's full of amazing resources. We need real-time information to guide what is an exceedingly complex governance system up there. And I think that's probably the, if you had to pick a third, that would be it. And I think the governments are beginning to construct a system to work with each other on the basis of information and make really smart choices up there. Robbie, where do you see this yeah, technology? Yeah, actually, so my well top down. three are, are very, very similar. Um, w being able to do better marine monitoring, polar monitoring, and high-impact weather monitoring are the three big areas. I think, uh, touching on what Carter just said, we're, one of the things we're excited about Puma systems and other systems that you can launch from ships is that we do a lot of ocean cruises to, to monitor um, you know, coral reefs and activities in the ocean, but also to, to look at climate changes, the air quality, air chemistry. And by taking a ship out, if we can add UASs to that, that ship and increase the distance the lo uh, that it can observe for a given ship, we're actually saving, saving money. And have something that, could, that we could use for rapid response. Just, you know, if, a dare, if a derelict fishing gear popped up or if there is an illegal fishing ship, that we can put that into action. The third one is, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the second one is also the Arctic. I think there's a lot, we, there's so much more we need to learn about the Arctic. Satellites have done a very good job of, of taking pictures of what's happening up there, but when you put all the satellite data you get together, you get a very good picture of the annual things that are happening in the Arctic. But being able to understand what's happening on a day to day and how it's affecting the wildlife and the local ecosystems is something that we, if we could have systems that we could dependently fly up there, and you know, you think about it, that's one area where you're not going to fly a lot of manned aircraft up there because it's so dangerous. So I think discoveries in the Arctic and polar regions are going to be important. And then finally, high impact weather. We think that there are, there's much we can learn about being able to forecast weather systems and not just fly something in, in a storm that's in your immediate vicinity, but actually get out over the Pacific Ocean and look at storm systems as they're developing and building into frontal systems as they come across the United States. Trying to catch storm systems early when they're first spinning up and getting high, inf high detailed information about them then. We're seeing some very encouraging signs that we do think that we could actually improve hurricane intensity forecasts on the five to seven day level by being able to look at the storm as it's developing over the ocean. And do you see an area of overlap where, uh, you know, conservation and uh, sort of atmospheric forecasting would work together? Well, def well, I, I do, because I, I, I think one of the things uh, right now with, with um, federal agencies, civilian federal agencies, and especially agencies that deal with the environment and science and conservation, none of us have very deep pockets to invest in this kind of technology. So that if we can work together, uh, we've actually had this, con NOAA's had this conversation with USGS, we have interest in the Arctic why not you know, look at similar technologies? Are there ways that we can operate systems together and share information? Um, also, we, we try to keep in uh, very close touch with some of the other uh, agencies as to who's investing in which kind of technology. So if one agency is investing in that technology, then I might invest in this technology and hopefully together we'll bring them together and make a more powerful system. Uh, uh, yeah, of course, <laughs> of course there's interest in working together. I was just, um, reflecting that one of my kids uh, just did a drawing of dad at work and it's, it's got a tree uh, with a, 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 a gorilla in it and somebody's cutting the tree down and I'm like, I've got my fists up and I said, no, 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 that's not exactly what I do. Um, what we do more often is to try to get information in the hands of government officials to make the right decisions because at the end of the day, whether that tree stays standing in most parts of the world depends upon the government um, uh, having the information but making the right decisions. And so a lot of our work is, um, is about collaborating with governments, getting the right data to them at the right moment in time so they do the right thing. And as we know, governments don't always do the right thing. But I think if you get uh, information in the right places at the right time, it gives us a better chance. You know, I was reflecting on, um, in, the, in the previous session, the question about uh, the Boston Marathon. And um, we do not want to document the demise of nature. That's not what we want to do for a living. What we want to do is engage decision makers when there's still time 
to keep nature intact. And I think that's the greatest challenge with this kind of information, is how do we get it real time so we're not just uh, writing another sad story, uh, but we're actually um, helping governments make decisions, whether that's proactive sustainable development or whether that's catching the bad guys uh, before more bad things happen in the future. I thought in the time left to us that uh, we'd open up to questions if people have any. Oh. Hi, Gene Kilby, and I'm with a company called Aero International. You mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. Roberts, uh, that the governments were cooperating in the uh, in the Arctic uh, for policy there. Does that include Russia? Uh, absolutely, it uh, does. Yeah, there, it's, um, um, there is something called the Arctic Council, which is a new, um, it's a new um, entity that's been created by the eight countries that control most of the Arctic that are beginning to look at information-based joint decision-making and governance around a set of issues from um, species to fisheries to minerals to oil to navigation lanes. And they're beginning to tackle those one by one. And um, it's actually one of the more promising parts of the planet. The Arctic, unlike the Antarctic, the Antarctic has a very tight governance system built around it. I think probably because it's terrestrial. There are historic reasons for that. The Arctic is just beginning to emerge this new, the, a new governance system. It's largely going to be about marine issues. And, um, and the real issue is how do we put all that data on the table at the same time and then make the smart choices? Where to, where to fish, where to drill for oil, where to keep areas uh, intact instead of making those decisions one by one. And I think the next big meeting of the Arctic Council is going to be in Iceland and in the fall. And I have high hopes for it, but a lot of it depends upon data. Also with the Arctic Council, there is a subcommittee that's looking at just at UAS activities for the Arctic. There's someone at the back. Uh, Timothy Reuter, DC Area Drone User Group, again. Um, I, I'd be interested, th there's obviously some social stigma attached to UAS and particularly the word drone. And I wonder if you've had any pushback on the work that you're doing based on the associations that people have uh, of these machines with warfare or surveillance, um, either internationally or domestically. Thank you. Good yeah, question. yeah. You know, I um, so I uh, certainly we're concerned about that. Um, our experience to date has been every time there's a story about the work that we do, there's a side narrative about the dangers and and all the rest. But I think um, more generally, what we have gotten is a positive response to uh, to the possibilities. I um, I think um, you know w w I, every time we we launch a major initiative. We think about you know the worst possible things that can happen. We think about um, uh, we want to make sure there's public support, support from governments. I think there's always been um, the question that you raised, but I think overwhelmingly um, the response we've gotten has been positive, largely because we're getting our head handed to us in uh, when, in this wildlife trade issue. You know the, we are so outmatched technologically that um, anything we can bring to bear on this is seen as a positive step. I would say for, for Noah, um, that, that question comes up uh, a, a bit, but not as much. I think it's because of the, the kinds of missions that we're trying to do. Uh, there's already a, you know, a built-in uh, societal benefit to most of the things we do. And so it doesn't come up as much, but we, we try to be sensitive that this is a, a, an issue for the whole community. It's the same thing as with the airspace regulation. It's we're all in this together and we're all working to make sure that we're putting the best image forward. Let me, what, just one other thing though, you know, if you're talking about the Kalahari Desert, the privacy issues aren't as great as they might be in downtown Washington, D.C. And I think that's another reason why um, we, we don't get the, the, the kind of issues that, that you've raised. 
And at NOAA, what, uh, in terms of the privacy issues, what kind of altitudes are we talking about uh, Well, actually, here? The, things, the things that we've flown, and, and mainly our program has mainly funded demonstrations more than actual purchase, but we're looking at uh, things that could fly as low as 500 feet out over the ocean to get a better understanding of the, the, the boundary layer between the atmosphere and the ocean. Uh, uh, 12,000 feet, 40,000 feet, and then the highest would be the Global Hawk, which is 60,000 feet. So it completely depends on the application that we're looking at, what kind of sensors the, the platform can carry, and then how the data are going to be used when it's brought back. And, and really, it's what I try to tell people where it's an observing system, and it's how are we going to use the data that defines um, wh wh whether we need to use an unmanned vehicle or not. Hi, I'm William, Angel. I'm William Angel again. Um, given the WWF and NOAA's use of aerial platforms to collect data, if you could use unmanned aerial systems to decrease the cost of information and data and surveillance, how would that let you more effectively accomplish your goals? The, the cost is one thing that we have to look at all the time, and it's definitely at NOAA because we already have a lot of observing assets. So with new technology, we have to prove that we're as good, if not better, and cheaper than what's already on the table. So we're do running those cost numbers uh, quite a bit. Um, if we were to buy a Global Hawk brand new, we probably uh, couldn't show that we were cost effective just yet because we're learning how to use it. But we're partnering with NASA, who's taken retired uh, vehicles uh, from the Air Force and modifying those. And so actually w our costing numbers right now are showing that we're comparable to s some of the other aircraft. The other thing about it, though, is uh, one of the things, a lot of what we do is say, let's, let's just use hurricanes as an example. We have aircraft that fly a lot into you know, hurricanes of the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. One of the things that the Global Hawk can provide is now you've got a vehicle that you can take really far out over the ocean. So now we can start looking at weather in Alaska and weather out over the Pacific. And you can start moving that asset around from place to place. We do, we do that to a certain extent with our manned aircraft, but uh, logistically it's a little more complicated. I, you know, it's interesting. The Global Impact Award that we received from Google was really all about experimenting. It was about experimenting with different technologies and try to find the right sweet spot, which would be simple, practical, repeatable, scalable. And when I was in Nepal, you know, the guys on the ground there kept saying to me, don't subject us to overly sophisticated technologies that we can't keep using in the field because there's such a range of technologies here and the simpler the better, both in terms of repairing them when they crash or bad things happen, uh, and also for people to use them in very remote settings around the world, um, the simpler the better. And so I think that's, that's our starting point, is how do we get something that's simp simple, practical, cost effective, so that we can have lots of people using them in these very remote regions. Okay, I, I think uh, I've had the stop sign. <laughs> Thank you both so much. That was great.